So, gonna get right on into it, right? Something that I thought about and something I've been mulling over a little bit, just in terms of what's going on with you know COVID and all that sort of stuff and entertainment industry and nightlife and all that stuff, because I'm interested in, in community, right? I DJ myself, right? I've DJed myself for the best part of what ten plus years. I was promoter for maybe five years. I was probably one of the hardest jobs I've done. I'm not gonna lie. Trying to get people to go to a venue that doesn't have because that's the thing people don't re- understand about promoting if you once you get into it and you actually work if you really want when you get into it for the love cool i'd appreciate the music that's fair enough but then you slowly but surely realize that the places that you're going to that are just you know the, the kind of entry level places where you go and promote are usually the the clubs and venues that already established a bit of a following and for some time <coughs> and you could be led to believe that it's a bit plug and play so it's really hard to judge how successful you were in your promoting and how much it had to do with just the club being or the venue itself being popping. So once you build up a bit of steam, you build a bit of a reputation for yourself, um, you've obviously got a good clientele, a good customer base, you then want to maybe branch out in the hopes of maybe breaking even or dare I say making some money. And also because you want to test yourself and see where do I actually lay on the, where am I actually on the promoter totem pole, right? Um, how, f- um, how much work have I actually done? How much are people are to my brand? Do they actually love what I'm doing? All these sort of questions come into your head. So you kind of want to prove it to yourself that you're actually as good as you think you are. Then you go out and you, you know, you uh, hire a venue somewhere where you have to kind of hire, you have to you hire a venue, then you have to hire all the equipment for a venue that doesn't have any, you know, um, equipment in there. And then you slowly but surely realize, oh, I'm not as big of a deal as I thought I was, right? And then you have to start from scratch again. So you have like two kind of phases of your promoter journey. You have the phase where you're sort of plugging and playing in bars and clubs. Then you have the phase of your promoter journey where you're essentially going to random places and trying to make those things as successful as your previous venues. And it's so difficult. You do not understand how difficult it is to get people out of their homes to a venue that they're not heard about to listen to people that they don't really care about. Which then goes to explain why, as much as I know the DJ community, especially um, techno Twitter, they they can get a bit annoyed at the fact that places like awakenings places like i don't know whatever else of a festival that goes ade they can get annoyed that they only book the same people year in year out part of the reason or most of the reason the majority reason is because those people sell tickets right they put bums in seats uh, for lack of a better term and that is so rare to find especially nowadays where everyone's really concentrating or bothering about social media it's proper difficult to find people who are on the come up who obviously have a popping social media but also are able to get people out of their homes it's not easy so when you do find them you're just going to hold on tight especially if they're in their infancy you're going to make sure you want to be part of their journey so all that to be said um there's obviously been a really big prevalence this it feels like there's been a bit of a sea change in terms of electronic music space or the the entertainment industry in general right it's been completely decimated by covid people have been suffering left right and center and um you're obviously because that industry is gone right for the most part any mass gatherings you're not allowed to have them so a lot of these people's income has essentially been slashed to if not half if not most of their income is completely gone and if they haven't diversifies their income stream because they didn't think they needed to right if they didn't have any other way of getting any kind of money then they're definitely hurting right now even if they've got productions that are selling you know people are probably not buying tunes as much as they were in previously because they don't have much disposable income so every point of their income stream is being disrupted by some way shape or form but a lot of these people that are complaining especially some of the bigger artists you sometimes scratch your head and you think to yourself how are you complaining when you play at some of the best festivals in the world you obviously get paid let's say don't count anyone's pockets but let's say they're getting paid 10 grand per set right or per appearance it makes you think like if you were smart enough especially if you come from the ground up and you've worked in bars and pubs like i have you would be aware of just how little you can earn and if you're at the you know at the pinnacle of the mountain you'd also be appreciative of how much you're earning now and be like hell i'm gonna make sure that i save some of this because this is never guaranteed because i know where know i've been you know djing let's say for lack of a better reference you've been djing at fucking you know hoxton bar and grill for the best part of six years and suddenly now you're playing the big festivals you know what it is to be fighting over 150 pounds to play in some pub where no one cares about you being there then suddenly going to a festival where you're getting paid a couple of grand you're gonna make sure you look after that money you'd imagine so right so one of the things i've been really disturbed by is seeing all these really successful um by the looks of it affluent djs who are trying their best to basically push events to go on to happen people to mass gather in the hopes that they can play out again mostly because it seems like they don't have any other income coming in but i'm thinking why do they have anything saved 
which made me think about the story about Dan Bilzerian, right? So I'm sure you're familiar with who Dan Bilzerian is. He's essentially the idol of 13 year olds on Instagram all around the world. Um, <coughs> He's on there floating his cash, floating his access to really hot and attractive women who he has to, who he essentially hires, it looks like, to travel and world around him. Um, some of them, of course, I'm sure, use that platform of Dan Bilzerian to kind of boost their own profile. Um, he has access to all these rich, influential people. You know, it's all, it's the kind of glitzy show life that if you were a teenager or if you're approaching your teenage years, I wouldn't be angry at you for thinking that this is something to be um heralded and something to be like you know respected and think oh wow i can aim for something like this right because on paper he's living that kind of um rock star lifestyle that a lot of those kids would want to live without actually having you know of course rockstar lifestyle you know you are led to believe that you have to have some kind of musical talent but if you just want to be a, a social media public figure um dan Bazaar is probably the best example of that and maybe is can be some kind of role model to those kind of kids right <clears throat> Don't get me wrong, I don't agree with it, but if you dash your intention of life, then why not look at someone like Dan Brazilian? But for the longest time, a lot of people have been thinking, this story doesn't make sense, right? It, did, it just didn't make sense that somebody that would play poker, admittedly, get rich off that, and that somehow was able to sustain the lifestyle he has just off um, the riches that he's assumed from playing poker. It just didn't add up to, right, right? And if you spend any time on the internet, if you spend any time reading books of successful people, um, whether they're successful in business or, yeah, whether successful in business, whatever, you know, avenue it may be, usually the way to attain wealth or the way to uh, sustain that level of, of flagrancy, that level of, um, you know, materialism, that level of spending, you need to have something that you're selling or a service you're providing. You just can't do it purely based off of like um, one-off winnings of some game that you played. It just isn't, doesn't make any sense. So a lot of people have been kind of, you know, um, guessing that maybe he's a trust fund kid, there's a wealthy backer behind him, putting money into his account, blah, blah, blah. But we didn't know how far it went until this article came out from Forbes, right? And Forbes were the first people to break this. So Forbes initially broke the story that Dan Bozzeria may not be as rich as he essentially claims um, based on the fact that his business, Ignite, the CBD company that he's got that was, I think, started off as a weed company, then went into CBD. They're essentially been uh, losing, I think, 50 million, I don't know, dollars, let's say, over the year or something stupid like that, right? They've just been absolutely burning through money. And that lawsuit then also led to the fact that one of their former presidents um, decided to sue um, Ignite, Dan Bozzeria's company, for wrongful um, dismissal and defamation because he basically blew the whistle on the fact that Dan Bozzeria, instead of spending the money that he allegedly earned, from his poker days was charging all of his expenses to the company card which goes to show you that quite admittedly his lifestyle even though there might be some aspects of it that are legitimate all in all it means that he wasn't necessarily living the life he the live the lifestyle he was planning portraying wasn't necessarily correct wasn't necessarily right it didn't was necessarily the truth and that led me to think about the djs that were complaining about the performances because i feel as if a lot of these people especially when i read this article later but a lot of these artists, a lot of these people in the entertainment industry or in this nightlife scene, it seems like they weren't able, they kind of purport to be, um, you know, uh, savvy businessmen. But for the looks of it, all of these people are renting. They're all renting, they're all leasing places, uh, airplanes, cars, whatever it may be. And those things add up and they don't have any kind of um, assets that they can sell or that they can liquidate to allow them to have more cash to sustain themselves during these times. So effectively, all these high rollers are in the same position that you and I are in, right? Where we essentially are having to work maybe for, you know, a decreased amount of wages in order to kind of keep the lights on or we're having to sell some of our assets in terms of, you know, making in order to have some money coming in or we're in a way or we're living a lifestyle where we're essentially having to rent most of our stuff right from my mobile phone contract to the apartment that i live in those things are formed you know kind of the bedrock of my day-to-day -day. those are things that i'm essentially leasing so those people that you know kind of shit on you and make you feel like you're nothing are exactly like you and i maybe they're not working maybe they're not working for a man but they're still living paycheck to paycheck they're still renting the things that, you know, we are renting, homes, mobile phones. Um, they're still kind of paying our pocket for holidays and stuff. And some of the stuff that I'll read on to you later on this article, you'll be like, Jesus Christ, the amount of spending is just, you know, out of this world, especially considering, you know, what's happening in the world at the moment. I'm assuming some of these avenues of income will slow down or what's happening in general, right? There's only so long you can continue spending outspending the things that you're actually making but it's just a really eye-opening story so it's just from forbes it says dan bozerian is a renter 
and someone else pays his credit card. Now, of course, they're being a bit spicy with the headline. I think these guys are at gloating at Dan Bozeron's demise, which I'm not. I still think he's pretty interesting dude um, to sort of like observe from the outside. I think he plays an integral part in society, whether he's a cautionary tale or a point of people to just basically, you know, form some essays around. I think he's a fascinating figure in general. So I'm not happy that he's losing money or that he might end up being bankrupt. I just think it's an interesting case study as to how these sort of self-proposed, I don't know, I don't know if they're called self-help gurus or whatever they are, these lifestyle gurus who kind of purport to be one thing, but then when the truth is uncovered, it's actually quite closer to home, right? So it continues, it says, um, it's from um, Forbes. He says, um, the mansions, the yachts, the parties, the models, how does Dan Bozerian, the globe-trotting, cash-stocking, gun-toting, Instagram, boasting party playboy do it? Or more to the point, how does he pay for it all? According to a lawsuit file this week, he doesn't. Dan Bozerian rents his homes and charges the rest of his six-figure lifestyle to a credit card that someone else pays off, which is probably the most interesting part of it. Fair enough, he rents, but I wonder who's, a, who's that wealthy benefactor. Is it somebody that's involved in i don't know is that like a criminal on the world person is that somebody involved in a foreign intelligence service or is that just his wealthy backer that is just always remained behind the scenes that's just kind of living indiscriminately through him or is it the person that's kind of always pictured off the camera because you've always wondered right imagine this table here a picture of these everyone sitting on the table there's obviously somebody sitting here maybe it was a girl or maybe it was one of the wealthy benefactors that's kind of always out of shot similar to those kind of instagram baddies that go to you know saudi arabia and dubai to get a new body done or to get shit all over their chest and then the guy that actually calling them or send them over is completely you know it doesn't want anything to do with social media maybe that's part of it who knows it continues it says um the lease on his home in the ritzy los angeles hills for example is two hundred thousand pound a month dan bozerian does not pay his rent so that is kind of similar to the thing that's going on at the moment in the fire and the kid community or in the joe rogan podcasting sphere right where a lot of the Fans of Joe Rogan are kind of ragging on Brendan Shaw from The Fire and the Kid because he went out to do comedy, caught COVID, and since then has been really kind of, um, how do you say, he has been sort of, um, he's sort of doubled down on his stance that COVID is just a flu. If you get it, 99% of people will be okay, blah, blah, blah. But part of his motivation to go out, if you're someone like a Brendan Shaw, is going to be because your entire lifestyle is rented, right? You don't actually own most of the things that you have. Whether or not you have a business that you run and he's got a couple of successful podcasts or a few of them anyway, um, I'm sure he does, you know, he's got a salary coming in from Showtime, blah, blah, loads of good stuff happening in his life. But if you're renting, especially at that scale, at that level, it only makes sense when you have a constant flow of income or of opportunities coming your way. So the amount of your rent, it just won't matter. Do you know what I mean? I think it's similar to these, you know, um, artists and stuff, right? These um, rappers who basically boast about their kind of uh, fees that they get when they go to shows, partly because they know they're just going to blow, you know, if you get 100,000 per an appearance, you're just going to blow the 100,000 like it's 10 pound because you know you're going to get it next week. But once those events stop, um, it then becomes a little bit harder to justify paying, you know, 200,000 for an apartment somewhere in the Hollywood Hills. It doesn't, it's not going to work out no matter how much you're earning, no matter how much you're, no matter how much you're making, you're always going to be at some level of a deficit really, because you know, you're trying to, you're, you're basically outspending how much you're basically making, which is nuts really to think of that. And you just would expect somebody of the, I don't know, maybe, I mean, maybe, um, a bit ignorant or naive in that respect but i would expect somebody of his level of wealth to have access to some really smart business managers or people that could help him out to maybe buy some things that he could essentially use as assets to make some money for him whether they're homes office buildings whether it's investing in a sure bet startup i don't know there's, there's obviously avenues that he could do that could allow him to be self-sufficient somewhere rather than not. But after reading the four hour work week and what basically Tim Ferriss was basically cautioning against all those, all those years back in the day, but I don't know, maybe the four hour work week title was a bit triggering. But if you think about it, the four hour work week um, premise around the idea of being lifestyle um, of, of having a, sorry designing your own lifestyle and being um in the what's it called? time independent i forgot what that may be right where you're basically you're trying to frame your lifestyle in a way where you're not dependent on always working based on always making money based on the amount of time you're working so you essentially when you're sleeping whatever you've invested in the business that you've started is able to make you money whilst you sleep but you're also constant of the idea of making sure you diminish your outgoing so whether it's you know working remotely somewhere in southeast asia whether it's hiring 
um, virtual uh, PAs or people working abroad. Well, it's kind of like the same model that Kylie Jenner has of her cosmetics brands, right? Where you kind of have this whole cosmetics empire and you only have five full-time employees and everyone else is outsourced. So that was the whole premise behind it. And I remember at the time everyone was like, oh, this is stupid. No, you have to work 17 hours a day. Right? He got ragged on quite a bit. But if you think about it, really, it's quite a sound advice. Because you could be Dan Brozone if you wanted to, but you just would have to decrease the unnecessary bits of spending, right? Like the private jets and the yeah. tanks and stuff. You could obviously do it, but it would take a it would take a it would take a bit of um, savviness to kind of get it done. But which obviously Dan Brozone doesn't seem to have or doesn't really care for. The continuous system, the house, the, everything else, the models, the flights, the yachts is charged to a corporate tab at ignite international limited the company the brazilian founded and serves as ceo and majority shareholder according to cartis hefferman ignites recently outed former president paying dan brazilian 2.5 million annual rent and paying everything else dan brazilian does was would be an explanation for how ignite managed to lose a report with 50 million a year uh, last year as Forbes was reported so imagine his Ignite company which looks a bit shitty to begin with anyway but fair enough he's trying to do something right he's trying to leave some sort of positive imprint or trying to make some think of the amounts of wealth and privilege or opportunities he's been given that's a that's a definitely something to be heralded but you know it's already struggling as it is because there's a million and one CBD weed companies out there in the US who are trying to kind of, you know, gain some steam before it, it becomes, before it gets legalized nationwide. They're all trying to kind of, you know, they're all trying to carve their own lane. But it didn't seem that special to me. So on top of that, you're then charging all your expenses, all your flagrant trips and all that stuff that you're doing. Or maybe he's kind of overly charging it and being a little bit cheeky and adding, you know, we, we, we've all done it. You work in the office sometimes and you might add a couple bits more, you know, maybe a, a meal that you're not meant to add to your expense list. You're going to add it on there, but it's usually forgiven, right? But you don't go as far as charging, you know, the hiring of uh, models from far flung places on the earth to go hang out with you to your company card or a mansion that is got no other purpose from you just hanging out with your friends and you know smashing loads of blondes you can't really do that to the company card that's not really on it that's really taking the piss and he continues says um and according to Hefferman suit complaining about Dan Brazilian's addiction to spending company money and objecting or to uh, various sleight of hand tricks that would hide his expenses are what got him fired um, through his co through his company counsel Ignite did not respond to a request or comment in a statement issued by TMZ Brazilian denied the allegation in Efferman suit and vowed to counter suit um, however Ignite's employees who spoke on condition of anonymity fearing of the personal replications uh, confirmed of much of Hefferman's claimed of the suit it said Ignite pays for everything one said models events he and Dan would just have it wrapped in the Ignite logo and all of a sudden it was an Ignite expense and he would send them all the bill that is some scumbag marketing tricks and I've been in marketing teams before where people have kind of suggested the same sort of thing right where they've maybe co-opted someone's uh, campaign and slapped their logo on it or just went to take advantage of it through sales whatever right but that is some flagrant stuff man imagine doing an event at Coachella that has nothing to do with your company and suddenly just slapping your logo on it because you happen to be there, which maybe is part of the problem. Which maybe that's the wisdom of having a separate themselves from their business, right? They can do something that's completely div divorced from what they do independently in their own life. That's really, really important. But imagine the same thing could be said for conducts business or how they treat the employees can quite easily kind of separate them can kind of separate bezos the man and amazon the business right you don't need to kind of but once you are a pretty divisive figure in yourself and then you have a business that you're sort of linking you're trying to leverage your fame you're trying to leverage yeah your fame to the business um success it can also backfire because when people don't like you they're gonna you also tar your business with the same brush as well so that's maybe happening in this extent you don't really know it says here continue it said Events that had nothing to do with the business. Hefferman is seeking uh, damages for defamation, wrongful termination, and also for being intimidated, uh, terminated in violation of California state whistleblower protection laws. Hefferman, a former executive of the Procter & Gamble, joined Ignite on March 18, 2019. At the time, the company was trying to find its niche. Ignite pivoted from a recreational cannabis brand to a CBD company to a company that was happy to try to put the Ignite logo on just about anything. Fair, fair enough to Hefferman, but imagine leaving Procter & Gamble to go and work for somebody like a Dan Bozzeri. That's not a sound business decision, really, is it? Because obviously there's the idea that it could become... 
Hey, if you got, if you want, maybe again, if you got fire, it's a different thing. But if you purposely left Procter and Gamble to go le- work with Dan Brazier, and it's like you're obviously hoping he's a one in a million success because of it, business already it's difficult, right? Doesn't matter if you've got funds, doesn't matter if you've got access to people. Starting a business, whether you're rich or you're poor, is flipping this incredibly difficult. Making a successful business is one, you know, it's a one in a million shot. So he was hoping that Dan Brazier, on top of being a very divisive public figure, was also going to be very successful in a market that's already super, super cl- um, uh, cluttered, right? It's super crowded, the cannabis and CBD company, CBD industry. We don't really have the thing here because obviously can- cannabis isn't legal in the UK, but the CBD world has already got mad amount of people in it, right? Even the vape lounges, there's so many places popping up all over the place. So to try and bet your you know your life's work on this guy was a really really bad move in in retrospect has to be said in it come on man it continued here says uh <laughs> working out of a we work hefferman earned two hundred and seventy five thousand a year as vice president of sales according to his suit he became acting president of ignite in november and after the exit of his predecessor john mccormick a former tobacco executive i was talking about somebody the other day right but i was saying that more like a, how often have you been to, i don't know just right how often have you been to how often have you worked for a company or got a new job and the person that you're replacing left but you don't really know why they left and most of the time, I say, let's say eight out of 10 times, usually the reason why they left was valid. And you usually realize quite quickly why they left. Like whether it's, you know, a tyrannical boss um, and what's, it, what's the thing called? Um, unreasonable work expectations or whatever, right? There's always something that's gone on before, but it's hard to actually find out because no one's going to talk to you. That person that, you know, left prior, you probably you might not meet them. You might get a virtual handover. Um, they might not be willing to kind of be open because they don't know if you're going to snitch. It's, there's loads of things going on in there, but it's always a bit of an issue. That, anyway, when you walk into a company to replace somebody, um, you always feel as if in the back of your head, there's probably a reason why this person left, isn't it? A legitimate one. And you felt the power there. But imagine earning 275000 working out of a fucking WeWork. Mad, isn't it? That's the thing that makes WeWork so interesting. In the same building... Where there's, you know, companies, you know, one company doing a shitty start, one company doing a good startup. There's such a disparity in the pay in startups. It's just awful, right? They have interns working for 16000 a year and then the person above you is making forty two. It's like, you know, come on, man. Let's have some incremental salary steps at least. You know what I mean? Um, he said, continues here. So trouble arose in May 2020. Red flags were first raised by accountants doing the books in preparation for Ignite International uh, Brands Annual Report, reported by the Canadian Stock Exchange. According to the suit, the accounts flagged 843,000 in company expenses that appear to be personal in nature. Just imagine, just a million pounds of company expenses. Like a million dollars, sorry. That is insane, bruv. Um, these included payments for charges racked up on one of Dan Brazilian's credit cards, a half a million dollar yacht rental, a six-figure two-night trip to London. Imagine spending that much. Oh, my God. 65,000 Four Elements guns and Star Wars set, a 50,000 pound bed frame, which maybe, you know, he probably needed. He probably gets a lot of use out of that bed, you know, if, if, you, if you believe what you read on the internet. Um... Uh, 75,000 paintball field and 80, uh, 88,000 pound vault, a for $88,000 vault to name but a few. The company also paid 26,000 to boost uh, Belzerian's Instagram followers and paid for travel expenses of the rotating cast of models that permanently accompany Belzerian wherever he goes, the suit claims. Brother, brother, this guy still pays for Instagram followers. This is insane. Now, I I don't believe this was a factor. I think that the the higher up you are, the more it seems to, the, the the bigger you are as a celebrity, the more beneficial it is for you to buy Instagram followers, right? Because the assumption is that if you've got a million, it's very difficult to gauge. Maybe it's not. If you look at the ratios, you can probably tell by likes and followers. But if you're not savvy to all that stuff, it's probably high easier to hide adding an extra 10,000 followers on your Instagram page via paid services as opposed to doing it when you're just a nobody. So I've long believed that's the case. And also people don't realize just how, um, um, how, uh, how much of a, what, how kind of benefits you monetarily to buy Instagram followers, especially for a celebrity. The amount of endorsements you could get, the amount of brand deals you could get, the amount of exposure it could give you, the amount that I'm sure some studio executives probably look at people's Instagram followers and decide who to bet on in terms of who to go for when they're deciding on who's going to get the role ultimately, especially if it comes down to two people that are maybe closely matched or closely 
um, yeah, our matching skill set, maybe the deciding factor is who's got the biggest exposure, who can get us more retweets, who can get us more shares. So I'm not surprised by that, but imagine spending £26,000 worth, mate, on Instagram followers. That is mad, isn't it? It's for $26,000. Sorry, I keep saying pounds. Bloody hell, man. Um, Heffman also pressured by other company executives and members of the Ignite board to sign off on expenses that Ignite's business charges he claims suspecting fraud according to the suit Heffman tried to convince Bazarian to at least dump 20, 200,000 a month mention because after all the COVID-19 pandemic is hitting South Carolina sorry South, Car South California hard um, how can you have splashy marketing events with social distancing requirements he says at that point the suit claims Bazarian jumped in as chairman of the board and said I'm going to do something summer I'm going to do some summer um, pool parties and will utilize the house. The next day, Bazarian accused Hefferman of doing drugs during a company meeting, according to the suit, and fired him on June 8th. That is a that is even madman. Uh, the annual report uh, showing Ignite staggering losses and also showing the companies um, involving uh, Ignite shareholders on the board members loaned the company cash to keep it afloat was made public on the Canadian Stock Exchange website about a week later. Hefferman did not respond to a call for comment in a statement to his attorney. Tamara Free said that the client looks forward to his day in court. Will it get that far? That may depend on what Dan Bazarian, who employees describe as almost a fanatically image conscious, decides he's comfortable with the public knowing or how much balance is left on his credit card to pay the lawyers bloody hell so he's a fraud to, again not fraud fully because there's parts of his story that are obviously true but definitely the parts that people were kind of calling out the idea that he basically made his, most of his um, wealth from poker isn't true because anybody that's going to because I, I, I don't know because it could be argued if he's willing to sign off all of his expenses to his company card it could mean he doesn't have any of his own money to spend or it could just mean that he's taking advantage of the fact that he's got a company card and everyone does it right because i'm i remember working for a company where one of the ladies i was working for she was very very loose and very she was very loose and very happy to slap the company card just about anything she, she did right um whether it's a lunch a dinner whatever she slapped in the company card and then of course some staff members took the piss of that but most of the time she was doing it all the time like any any time she was in the office the company paid for her food basically um and that happens quite often so maybe in his head he's just doing the he's just doing what everyone else around him is doing but at a higher level maybe i don't know but it's bloody interesting to see in it so let's see how that story kind of rolls out but i thought that was interesting to start off with 